Phil Galfon, known online as OMG Clay Aiken and JMan28, is one of the world's toughest cash game players. His daily life consists of risking hundreds of thousands of dollars in high stakes cash games online, and he has even taken his game to the hit show High Stakes Poker on GSN, where he ended up after his session versus some of the best players in the world. This month alone, he is up $1.3 million. Galfond recently took part in the World Poker Tour Championship here at Bellagio. He was among the chip leaders on day two, but he took a swing for the worst and he was out before the day's end. We have Phil here today to talk about what happened in that tournament, how he got into high stakes cash games, and about optimal cash game play. So thank you for being here with us today, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks well, for having me. First off, you amassed a lot of chips at the WPT Championship yesterday, and then you ended up getting knocked down. How did you amass the chips, and then what happened that got rid of most of them? Yeah, um, I mean, most of the hands were standard. Early on, I won more flips than I lost. Later on, I lost more flips than I won. <laughs> I actually had one really interesting hand early um, that I wanted to brag about. <laughs> where um, We allow brag posts here. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I think it was... Uh, it must have been 400, 800 blinds, so first day, I'm about 80k deep, and I open the button with Jack-4 offsuit, and Amir Vahidi calls in the small blind, uh, big blind folds, so there's like 7k in the pot, and the flop is queen, eight, seven, rainbow, and he leads into me for 3,500, half pot. Um, I make it 8k, he thinks for like 15 seconds and calls. And the turn is an ace, bring two hearts. So it's queen, seven, eight, ace, two hearts. He checks. I bet 13k, which I think is okay. Like, he has to fold maybe third of the time to make it right, or whatever. And uh, he calls. And the river's a king, bringing a third heart. And so he, now you have a straight out there, a possible straight, possible a third straight, heart. Possible flush. Um, and he bets into me. Plus we had, you know, two bets going on the flop, one on the turn. He bets into me for 22K, and I call, and he mucks. <laughs> he mucks before you even turn over your hand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, I, he, I, he said he had 5-6, but I just had jack high. <laughs> but, I, um, yeah, because I didn't think that, um, besides jack 10 or, like, pair plus flush, I didn't think anything played it like that. Okay. Anyways, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were one of the chip leaders on day two. Was it anything that you were doing wrong that was knocking you down, or was it really just a matter of getting yourself into a bunch of flips that didn't work out for you? And if that's the case, sh should you have gotten yourself into so many flip situations? You know, um, the way I play tournaments, and I, I can't really be sure it's the right way, but I think it is, because I, I don't have a whole lot of tourney experience. But um, I, I guess I play a pretty high-variant style, so that I do end up getting big stacks and end up losing big stacks. But um, I think it puts me in a good position to, to win the whole thing. But uh, also gives me a good chance of getting knocked out. And so um, I definitely put myself in a lot of situations like that where I'm risking my, my tournament life. But um, I, I don't think I played it badly. I mean, with a couple hands here and there, maybe. But no, I, I feel like I played well. Okay, so no regrets. Mm -hmm, no. Well, you started out playing poker, playing cash games with what has been said to be a significantly um, under-rolled bankroll. So why did yeah. you do that, and how did you overcome that? Um, it's probably, I mean, it was a bad decision. <laughs> I st when I started out, I played sit and goes for, I was a sit-and-go pro for a year and a half, and then uh, I moved over to cash games. And uh, I played well within my role for a while until, I guess, party shut down, and I started playing on UB and full tilt. And I don't know, I never really was at risk for losing all my money. I would just play, I, I'd play like 300, 600, 60K buy-in on, on a 400K roll, which is way under-rolled. But if I lost 60K, I would, I would I'd stop. So I was never really at risk to lose everything because I could, if I lost, step down. You know, some people have to chase their losses, and I could handle just losing the 60K and moving on. Um, I still think it was probably a bad decision, <laughs> and I did run bad the first few times, but eventually, you know, it worked out, and I stayed up there. Well, so how did you get into high stakes poker to begin with then? Um, poker in general or just higher stakes? Like the higher stakes. Like how did you build yourself up to be able to do that or were you already rolled for it even though you were under rolled? Um, sit and goes actually, I did pretty well in sit and goes and um, from there for like a year and a half I built my roll up steadily. 
uh, moved to 510 cash, which I was rolled for, but I wasn't good enough for because I never played any cash games. Um, and how did you get into that? What, what made your decision to do that? Um, actually, my friend Peter Jetton, mm -hmm. he, uh, he, was, he played Sit and Goes too, and he said switched over to cash and just told me, you know, you can make a lot of money in cash. So I tried it. Um, I was probably a break-even player when I started, but I, I learned pretty quickly. And um, I built steadily up to like 10, 20. And then there were some good 50, 100 games, I guess, two summers ago, where I was really at like a 10, 20 roll. And I took shots at them and actually lost a lot. And then um, took shots again maybe in the fall of that year and, and ran well. So then it stuck. So are you still bad with bankroll management or do, have you kind of figured it out and gotten into the swing of things? Yeah, I'm actually I'm a lot more conservative now. I guess because... Um, you have more to lose, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely what it is. You know, when, you're, when you had 100K two months ago and now you have 800K... It's not like that upsetting to go back to 100k, but when you've had when you've had a certain amount of money for a while, it's like a mental line that's drawn. So if I were to like cross back down to that, I'd be pretty upset. So I, I'm I'm more careful now. Okay. Well, you've said before that one of the pivotal I'm sorry pivotal things in your growth as a poker player has been just having smart poker friends and talking to smart poker friends. What kind of epiphanies have you had talking to these people, and who in particular yeah. have prompted them i've pro i mean i've learned so much from all my poker friends and i'm i've i'm sure i hope i've taught them things too but um i guess my two friends who i've learned the most from uh one's tom Dwan, Durr, and um i just remember way way back i i didn't know what i was doing still really <laughs> and he, he was already a high stakes cash game player and i was having brunch no it was it was like 4 a.m i was having whatever meals at 4 a.m. <laughs> is the meal relevant? <laughs> yeah, no, okay. it's actually not. Um, I was eating with him in uh, Hollingall, uh, mm -hmm. plays on stars, and um, they were talking about a hand. And I, I don't remember the action of the hand, but the way it went down, basically, Hollingall had like a top pair weak kicker type hand and was facing a big bet on the river. And so I was thinking, okay, this is pretty close, call or fold. Uh, I'm not really sure. And, and Tom says, I would shove. And, like, it blew my mind because I just didn't consider, you know, that you have the option of turning, turning your made hand into a bluff just because it was a spot where, you know, Hollingall couldn't have air. So by shoving, he was just repping a huge, huge hand. And even though he's good some of the times, um, the times he's not good, he can push the other player off a hand. So it kind of started to make me think that every time you're faced with a decision, you have, especially in No Limit Hold'em, you have essentially unlimited options and uh, you have to look at the reasons for all of them and another one um, my friend Dan who is complete unknown but um, well, what's his name uh, his name's Let's make Dan, him known <laughs> Dan Quinn okay um, he plays he plays 510 through 2550 online and um, he lives in Madison with me and just comes over like four days a week and sits at the computer set up next to me and we just play poker all day but um, just having he's a really smart guy asks all the right questions and um, really thinks about the game hard. So just having each other uh, in the same room for that long, talking about hands that often, you just can't help but learn a lot. So just having somebody to talk to, yeah, it's huge. Okay. Well, one of your other poker philosophies is that whenever the action is on you, you have the opportunity to make the perfect play. How does thinking like that help you improve your game? Yeah. Um, I definitely think that's true. It's, it's much easier said than done to think like that. Um, basically what it is is, you know, <clears throat> what most people are thinking during a hand is something like, okay, please, no club, no club, <laughs> or, you know, please don't bet, check. Um, and, you know, that's really wasted energy. It's wasted thought energy when you could be thinking about, okay, if the turn is this, what should I do? Uh, if the turn is this, what should I do? If he bets this much, how should I react and why? So anytime you're, you're thinking about anything besides the right way to play the hand, you're wasting energy. And um, it also kind of, if you can think about it, is a challenge every time it's your turn to act to make the right play, the perfect play. It kind of becomes more of a, like a personal challenge than a, I don't know, a game where you win or lose a lot of money. <laughs> so I think it helps you, it helps you play better. It, yeah. Well, and like you were talking about, too, where it, if you think of every single possibility for every single card that comes out, 
on the turn or any, any kind of variation on what he may bet or what he may do, mm -hmm. the more you do that beforehand, the more naturally it will come when he actually does it. You won't even have to think about it anymore. You'll know the right answer to the question like even before he does it. Yeah. So you'll be wasting even less energy and you'll be able to pay attention to more things that are going on in the game, it seems like. Absolutely, yeah. And plus he uh, kind of prepares you. It's like playing ten hands at once. You get that much more experience because you're just looking at all these different scenarios that could play out. That's a very good point. Well, what weaknesses do you still have then that you're trying to improve upon? <laughs> Not improve upon, that you're trying to correct. Yeah, um, I mean, no, I, I don't know anybody that doesn't have leaks. Um, if I, like, exactly knew all my leaks, I'd, I'd try better <laughs> to fix them. I, I'm definitely too cally overall. Um, and I guess I am... Uh, I think I think I lose focus too often. I think a lot of people do, but I think that um, I'm on my A game maybe 60% of the time, and that can definitely be improved upon. How do you improve your focus? Because that's a problem that I think a lot of people have, is that they, especially the internet players, they seem to lose focus really easily. Yeah. Um, I uh, I don't know if you know Tommy Angela. I was coached by him. He's um, he's a really great coach, really smart guy, and um, great writer. He. I don't know. He's taught me like a few a few things about it. What he likes to do is um, mentally reset before every hand. Um, like either by if you're playing live, have like one stack of chips to the side, and um, while while the dealer's shuffling, just move one chip over, um, which kind of just lets you know that you're you're realizing that the next hand's being played during the moment. And he also he's big on like breathing, and uh, he says he likes to take a big breath before every hand, just like a big conscious inhale and exhale. And I, I definitely do that, especially playing live, I do that whenever I remember to. But it's hard. I'm not really sure how to tell people how to fix it. Okay. Well, you've said before that you kind of put a challenge on the table to any live TV pro that's not named Ivy or Antonius, <laughs> that you would take them on in a heads-up match, and presumably because you could beat them. So do you really think that you are what seems to be the third best heads-up player in the world? Um, no. Well, it seems a bit cocky, but you're allowed to be cocky. <laughs> no, that does sound really cocky. I, uh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> okay. But, um, Why did someone take you up on it that you didn't want to? No, no. Um, just, um, because I, I don't know. I, I didn't really want to call anybody out. I said that, I think, in a post on 2 Plus 2. And I was upset about, um, like, the, how I didn't really get a great shot at, at playing on high stakes poker because um, I was bumped for some uh, TV pros, and um, I think it was like a big tangent to a really long post about just uh, poker and TV in general. Anyways, um, I guess officially I, I, I'd like to not challenge anybody, <laughs> but I mean I I I I would I don't I can't think of somebody who I'd refuse to play, so. If they want to challenge me, that's okay. But so, I, I don't want I don't want to call anybody out. So it's really not that you think that you're better than them all. It's that you're willing to try to hold your own against anyone except for Ivy and Antonius, basically. No, I wouldn't want to play. I wouldn't play in a game that I didn't think I was a favorite in. Okay. So I guess yeah, that's all. <laughs> well, I shouldn't well, have said that. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. What percentage of hands do you think is the optimal number to play in a heads-up match? Um, the truth is, it doesn't matter as much as most people think. Most people spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, it's, it's slightly player-dependent. You know, if your opponent's folding the big blind a lot, you can open every hand from the button. Against a lot of players, you can open every hand from the button. Um, if your opponent's not raising many buttons, you can't call a re-raise in the big blind that much. But I honestly think anything between playing maybe 35 and 65 percent of hands heads up it's pretty close Dep like depending on your style it can definitely all work at high stakes okay and do you think going over 65 may be overdoing it a bit and you can't you can't help but leak in the long run i think that against a good player yes um okay. if you're against a weak player who's not going to take advantage of it you're you can you can probably play it more and does a lot of uh which hands you fold depend on position i mean how important is position really in Heads up, especially compared to a full ring game. Position is really important in both. Um, but is it more important in heads up? 
It's maybe slightly more important just because it's that more often that you both don't have a hand. And when you both don't have a hand, it's better to be in position. But even when you both do have a hand, it's better to be in position to extract more value or, you know, check behind to save money. Position's huge. Um, I, I'm very careful about not playing big pots out of position. Well, it's kind of interesting, though, because it seems like more and more being out of position has almost become an advantage if you're a ballsy player. Because if the person behind you doesn't have a hand, if you bet even with nothing, a lot of times they're going to fold. Or if they do re-raise you, you can you know three bet and get them out of the hand. So sometimes not being in position, just being able to have the first action can give you an edge. Is that not true? I think it's more true in tournaments than in cash games. Because... Um... In tournaments, tournaments are kind of like a game of chicken. Because really, um, if, if you want to make money, you don't want to coin flip against somebody else. Because just your tournament life uh, is worth too much. So in a tournament, usually it helps to be able to, like there's a pot size bet left on the flop. It's kind of better to be out of position. So you can shove and put them in the spot where they have to get out of the way. But in a cash game where that doesn't exist, um, I don't think there's any situation where it's better to be out of position. Okay. Well, what do you think of the notion of having momentum in a heads-up match then? Because you hear a lot about that, about, you know, if you've won a few hands in a row, you have the momentum and you're bound to win even more hands in a row. Is there any truth to that at all that you see? Yeah, there is. Um, I think it's more... I think people, some people think it's like a magical thing, momentum, that, that just, <laughs> like... It, something that exists on its own and really what it is is just uh, for the most part confidence when you when you're winning your confidence is higher you you can um, you make better plays you make more risky plays especially in a heads-up match where you both have nothing if you're losing you know you're you know more afraid to make a check raise bluff you know this guy's been owning me I don't want to try anything so definitely the player that's been winning is gonna make more aggressive plays and pick up more pots which is advantage and heads up play. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I had for you. I really appreciate you doing this interview with us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you guys for watching the Online Zone on Card Player TV.